Well, thanks, Sarah, and thanks everyone for having me. It's a great honor to come here to talk about my journey. Um, I miss it every time I come. It's just great to be back. Um, so the other day I came across this sign when I was hiking in Florida. Um, it made me chuckle a little bit because this is something that I had to constantly remind my parents about as I went on my journey. Um, as you'll find out, uh, my journey was anything but the standard track that most people take to go to grad school. Um, so I hope that you enjoy it, and I hope that I can inspire you to take advantage of some of the undergraduate research opportunities that the college provides, as well as to dream big about what you can do in the future when you get that College of Idaho degree in your hand. So a little bit of a background, like what Sarah was saying, I majored in biology here. Um, I really enjoyed the outdoor program. It's a great opportunity here. Um, I was on the swim team. And believe it or not, I swam in other things just than flooded ketchup and mustard parking lots. I was on the real swim team. Um, during my time here, I did a lot of um, summer internships. These really helped develop my research interests and develop me into the researcher that I am today. Um, so one of the first internships I had was looking at the declining boreal toad in Rocky Mountain National Park and seeing if chytrid fungus was causing this decline. Um, my task in this internship was to hike up to these high alpine lakes, find the toads, make various measurements on them, use pit tags so that we could recapture them and know if we've had them before, and then to scrape them for chytrid fungus. The next summer, I had an internship where I was helping a PhD student work with um, black bear habitat. Um, my task with this job was to build these snares that you can see at the bottom here. Um, and then walk transects to see if we'd snared any bears. If we happened to snare a bear, we would collar it, and then we could use telemetry to monitor, monitor where it went. Um, this top picture is actually a black bear on my porch, um, and those of you who have done field research realize that it rarely goes as you'd hope. Um, I ended up seeing a lot more bears around my porch, in town, than in the snares. Um, poor Roger, the PhD student, ended up taking nine years to finish his PhD because of small sample sizes. Um, one of the most influential internships I had was a National Science Foundation research experience for the undergraduate. Um, this was sponsored by Cornell and the University of New Hampshire. Um, it was off the coast of Maine and the Isles of Shoals at Shoals Marine Lab. There were 10 of us invited to come to this internship, um, and we were each paired with one advisor and then we're giving an, given an independent project to work on. Um, I was tasked with looking at these two invasive crab species, Carcinus manus and Hemigrapsus sanguinius. Those of you who happened to attend this conference 10 years ago may recognize a few of the next slides. Um, I stole them from my creative undergrad years. Um, so Carcinus minus, the European green crab, invaded the US in the early 1800s. Um, its range is this red area here, and it inhabits the intertidal zone. Hemigrapsus sanguinius, the Asian shore crab, is a newly invaded species coming in the late 80s. It shares a very similar range, um, as well as overlapping in the intertidal zone. So my job was to see if these crabs were in competition on Appledore Island. So I had two hypotheses. The first was that both these crabs were in competition together. And then my second hypothesis was that they would switch from their preferred prey to a least preferred prey when in the presence of each other. So to do this, I had to find out what was actually available to these crabs to eat on the island. And then I also had to see what they were eating on the island. So to do this, I did gut content analysis of thousands of crabs. I then um, wanted to find out what their preferred prey was, so I did this by doing um, food samples for them in the lab. And then I wanted to know what were they eating in the field when they were in competition and what were they eating in the field when they weren't. So I did a caging experiment where I kept the crabs, each species individually in a cage or put the two of them together. So what I found out was that they both preferred um, Mussels, blue mussels, and amphipods when in the um, lab. What was available to them was green algae, brown algae, red algae, and um, blue mussels. Their preferred prey for the Asian shore crab was actually red algae, and for the green crab was blue mussels, 
But the interesting thing is, is that when they were in competition, the green crabs switched to eating red algae. So this has some very interesting implications in community and invasion ecology, and it actually led my advisor and I to publishing a paper. Um, back on campus, I also was involved in some different research projects. Um, Dr. Jim and Dr. Truxa um, helped me do some photometric studies of stars um, using the telescope on top of Boone. Um, and we had the good honor of being able to present at the Idaho Academy of Sciences. Um, I then was able to win a scholarship to travel to Kenya with the Kenya Rangelands Program, or Kenya Wildlands Program. This was a seven-week course um, run with the University of California, Santa Barbara in Kenya. Um, along with a lot of different field classes and lectures and activities, we each got to do an independent project. And I looked at how the um, spatial arrangement of acacia seedlings affected their predation by arthropods and also by small mammals. It was on this trip that the head instructor, Dr. Todd Palmer, um, I met him. He was this funny guy, really intelligent, um, and I kept in touch with him for several years, and he ended up inviting me to be his grad student, and he's now my current advisor. Um, of course, when you go to Kenya, you're gonna go on safari, um, so I wanted to show a couple of the beautiful pictures of landscapes and animals that we saw during this trip. I also had the great opportunity to go to um, Australia with Dr. Walzer and a couple of retired faculty, Dr. Seip and Dor Gallegos. Um, it was a six-week program to Australia, and the first six weeks were spent, or the first three weeks were spent at the Center for Rainforest Studies in the rainforest of Queensland. Um, Dr. Walzer and the other professors gave us different lectures and field activities, but we each did a group project. Um, my project was looking at niche differences between two similar tree frog species. To do this, we'd go out at night listening for the different frogs, and when we'd find them, um, we'd get up real close and then um, do some different niche measurements. Um, the second half of the program was on Heron Island, which is in the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. Um, Again, we had to do group projects, and my group looked at black damselfish and how they changed their foraging behavior depending on what part of the reef they were in. So this is a little schematic of where Heron Island is um, in relation to Australia, and then the two different um, reef zones that we looked at, the inner sandy zone and the outer living coral zone. Um, one of the best parts about Heron Island um, is the sea turtles. We were lucky enough to see um, hatchlings coming out to the ocean, seeing um, turtles laying eggs, nesting. Um, just a really amazing experience to get to witness all that. Um, a bunch of us took a diving class in the pool here at the C of I, which allowed us when we got um, to Australia to do some diving trips, which again, in the Great Barrier Reef to dive is just um, a fantastic experience. So with all these different internships that I had and field experience, um, it was actually fairly easy to land sort of a real job once I graduated from college. Um, I was hired as a biological technician with the research division of Rocky Mountain National Park. And this was a perfect job for someone who didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I liked to be outside and do field research, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, because with this project or with this job, I got to work with a whole lot of different projects. Um, so I'm going to share with you a few of my favorite projects that I worked on. Um, I got to help a fire ecologist look at fire history in the area, and he did this by using lake cores. I also helped the national park itself do a bighorn sheep monitoring study where we chased the sheep all over the mountains with telemetry equipment. Um, I helped with a hummingbird population study. We get to catch these cute little guys and then put bands on them and then set them free. Um, I also helped with a project that was looking at the effects of xenoestrogen on the sex ratio of fish in alpine lakes. Um, this is one of my favorite projects because they had this cool little mobile lab, um, and we also got to do a lot of fishing, and who doesn't love to fish? I also helped with a project looking at how chronic wasting disease was potentially affecting mountain lions, as well as I got my first taste of invertebrate zoology, um, looking at how different how the climate was potentially gonna affect the altitudinal ranges of butterflies and mosquitoes. 
Um, in the area where I was working, they have a big elk overpopulation issue um, due to the extirpation of wolves. So several of the projects were looking at how the elk were affecting the native vegetation. Um, and lastly, I got to get my feet a little bit wet or maybe cold, um, looking at glacier monitoring, um, which was another fun little study. So those of you who are taking some of these rigorous College of Idaho courses know that you kind of want to take a break when you're done. Um, one of my good friends, Lucas, and I dreamed up, I think, studying for one of Dr. Trux's organic chemistry tests, um, that we wanted to be done and go do something fun as soon as we got out of college. So we dreamed up ski bumming, and true to our word, we headed down to Vail Resorts um, the first um, winter after graduating. We were hired as shuttle drivers, um, so we drove around a lot, skied a lot of powder, had a lot of fun, but when I had finished getting as much powder as I could take, um, I headed back to the Treasure Valley where I was hired by a biotech company in Boise called Sapodyne Instruments. Um, they have a technology that's called Conexa, which, study, or which helps with finding the binding affinities and kinetics of different molecules. Um, so as a staff scientist with this um, biotech company, I helped do experiments in the lab. I also helped um, manufacture some of their instruments, but my main duty was to travel around the country and even around the world um, training scientists how to use this technology. So of course one of the great perks of doing that is that you get to travel around a lot and the bosses there were awesome. They themselves didn't really enjoy airplane rides and things like that, so they're like, when you go to these places, take some time and explore. So that's what I did. Um, but after a couple years working there, I realized that this field of biology wasn't quite what I wanted. I still missed the outdoors. Um, so I'd saved up some money working here. I had a whole bunch of airline miles, and so I decided to go to Southeast Asia for a year and do a little bit of soul searching. Uh, of course, a year in Southeast Asia is um, just one of those experiences I can't hardly even tell you about but I got to experience a lot of cool cultures, landscapes, I went to a bunch of conservation areas, um, et cetera. It was just an amazing experience. So when I got home, I decided I hadn't quite searched all of my soul. Um, I also still had a few airline miles left in my pocket, so I went back to Asia, um, this time via Russia on the Trans-Siberia Railroad. So I went through Mongolia, China, across the Himalayas and Nepal and eventually down to India. And what I found out during this trip and the previous one is that I spent a lot of time maybe annoying people, talking about conservation issues and why these different areas that we were visiting were important. Um, so the kind of planted the seed in my mind that I really want to get into conservation. So this time when I got home, um, I was hired to be a lead project manager with a South Dakota State University study on bighorn sheep nutrition. This study was trying to find out how important certain mineral licks were to lambing success of bighorn sheep. So this top picture, mummy range, is where the sheep lamb and spend the early part of their lambing. They then come down to this place called Horseshoe Park, which has these little mineral licks called sheep lakes. The one problem is that in between that mountain range and Horseshoe Park is a very busy road in the summer. So we were hoping that if we could show that um, this mineral licks are really important to the sheep, and sheep are very skittish by nature, so they don't like to cross roads, that if we could show how important it was that maybe they could build an underpass or an overpass or something like that. So in order to carry out this study, we spent a lot of time up in the high altitude mountains um, searching for sheep. Um, and so the way that you do this is once you've found the sheep, you look for a lactating ewe, and then you follow her around until she defecates. And once she does that, you collect the fecal sample for later nutritional analysis. Um, we, also, we did this up in the high mountains, and then again once they came down to the mineral licks. Um, of course, besides just doing fecal analysis, we also had to know what sort of nutrients was available to the sheep. So we did a whole bunch of vegetation surveys. Um, and as I was finding out, there's definitely a lot of perks to different um, field ecology jobs. Um, this one involved a lot of camping and staying in cute little cabins, which I really enjoyed. And um, in case you haven't figured out yet, I really enjoy skiing. And so when you'd hike up to these mountains to find sheep, 
When it's time to come home at night, you just ski right back down. So after this project, which this project was actually originally intended for a master's student who she just wasn't able to complete it. So I was hired to do this and I was successful with it. So I was kind of thinking, I think I'm ready for grad school. It also didn't hurt that my GRE scores were about to expire. So I went on a campus visit um, tour to a couple places and I ended up applying to Duke and Yale University, which have Master of Environmental Management programs, and then I applied to the University of Colorado and the University of Florida, which have more traditional Masters of Science programs. But the one thing that I'd always dreamed about doing was going to Antarctica. So while I was awaiting to hear back from these schools, um, I headed down to Antarctica. A couple C of I alums actually helped me um, get a job as a shuttle driver down there. So a shuttle driver in Antarctica basically means you drive these large vehicles with large wheels all around the base out to the different airfields to get the scientists to where they need to go. Um, of course, as someone who's an enthusiastic person for wildlife, I really enjoyed hanging out with the different wildlife in the area, including penguins, seals, and when the ice would break away, you'd even get some whales coming in. Um, so right after I got out of um, Antarctica, I heard back from the schools and I was accepted to all of them. So I had a huge decision ahead of me, which school did I want to go to? Um, I actually called several of the faculty here at the College of Idaho to discuss things like this. Um, I also contacted former employers and after a lot of debate, I decided that the University of Florida was the perfect fit for me. One of the benefits of working in Antarctica, however, is that you work really hard for six months and then you sort of have six months to play around until the next season. So the way that I got home after this first year in Antarctica was traveling from the very southern tip of South America up through Peru. Um, I really love mountains, so going through the Andes and Patagonia was just sort of a dream come true for me. During that trip, I found out that I was offered sort of a dream job in Antarctica um, to actually work with some of the science going down there. I was offered a job as an assistant supervisor of laboratory operations for the Crary Lab. Um, the problem was I was supposed to be going to grad school that next year. So I called up the University of Florida and my advisor and they were like, heck yes, go do this. It's, it's never bad to not to have experiences. So I headed back to Antarctica as a lab manager. Uh, my job there was to help scientists with logistics support, with some field support. Um, I took care of the aquarium down there, and I also gave tours to the non-scientists that were working down there. One of the other cool parts about the job was I got to go to some remote field camps to set up labs, um, such as this one in the dry valleys. A lot of you may be wondering what's it like in Antarctica. Um, McMurdo Station has about 1,000 people and I sort of imagine it as sort of college for 30-year-olds. Um, it's a small, really close community, a lot like the College of Idaho. There's gyms, there's a bar, coffee shops, um, basketball, all these different things. So up here in the top right is the Crary Labs dodgeball team. We were undefeated. Um, and of course, I got to ski, so it's always a benefit. So this was sort of my last hurrah before the rigors of grad school would be starting. So I headed to northern South America and every college has dreams of going to the Galapagos Islands. So I got to go there as well as explore some areas in Colombia and Panama and other places in Ecuador. So then I found myself in the swamp, sweating in the swamp. Um, University of Florida is a great place because Florida has an incredible range of biodiversity. Um, it's a great program. So as Sarah mentioned, I'm getting my master's in zoology with a focus in wildlife, ecology, and conservation. Um, and I was awarded a National Science Foundation fellowship to help aid my research. But the first year down there, I TA'd um, an introductory bio class, which was a lot of fun. Um, but then following that year, I headed to Kenya to work on my research. Um, in Kenya, not only did I work on my research, but I taught a field ecology class with my advisor. But my research was on pollination networks, and you can see this little schematic at the top right. It's a very simple pollination network, a few bee species, a few flower species. Um, so what scientists have found out is that 
these pollination networks have certain structural characteristics that allow them to hold up and not collapse. So I was wondering what would happen in the face of an anthropogenic changes if these um, structures would hold up. So I was looking specifically at climate change and mega herbivore extinction. So as most of you know, Kenya is in East Africa um, and Impala research station where I was working is in central Kenya. And I was utilizing a long-term experiment that my advisor had set up called Uhuru. Um, Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, but the acronym stands for ungulate herbivory under rainfall uncertainty. So here's kind of a close up of the experiment. Um, it's set up along a very strong rainfall gradient. Um, and there's three different levels of rainfall areas um, with three replicates each. And there's four different treatments for each of the replicates. So there's um, the first one is complete exclusion, which simulates total extinction. There's one that allows all the animals in, so no extinction. And then there's different varying levels of size classes that they let in simulating um, smaller extinctions. So my hypothesis was that when there was extinction or climate change, and I was using differences in rainfall variation as a proxy for climate change, that when this happened, you would have these strong networks that you can see on the left side would collapse into weaker networks. I'm currently still analyzing the data, so I can't tell you what happened. Um, but the way that one constructs a pollination network is you go out in the field and you find all the flowers that are flowering. You then watch each one for a given amount of time and you capture any insect that lands on or pollinates the flower. Um, once you've done that, you euthanize the insect using ethyl acetate. You take them back to the labs where you pin them. And then once they're pinned, you can identify them and build a pollination network. And this pollination network here at the very top right is much more symbolic of what a real pollination network looks like, very complex. Um, so around Impala Research Center, um, it's in the middle of the savanna area, very remote, but it's a nice research center. It has electricity for a couple hours a day, even some internet. Um, you live in these sort of local banda style housing, you can see in the far left above that vehicle. Um, something that I always think is funny and I like to share with people is my advisor owns these three vehicles that are very bright colored. Um, the reason he paints them bright is because if you're in the field and you're getting chased by an angry elephant or buffalo, you want to be able to find that car. Um, so I worked on sprinting a lot before I went down to Kenya. Um, of course, there's lots of elephants in the area. Um, this one that's in the middle right had been shot by a poacher, um, but it survived and we were trying to take the bullet out. Um, the top left is me and my field assistant celebrating being done with our um, research. They were four Maasai guys that I hired, um, really awesome workers. And then the bottom is Mount Kenya, which is the second highest mountain in Africa. And just out our back porches, we could see Mount Kenya. Um, after I finished my field portion of my um, project, I stayed for several months to help with a um, project looking at sort of the range of cheetahs and wild dogs, um, both endangered species in Kenya. Um, so my um, tasks with this internship were to do spore surveys as well as to track the animals with telemetry equipment. And so to do that, you of course have to dart the animals to put on collars. So here's a picture of me with one of the wild dogs that we called Spot. Had a nice little spot on its haunch. Um, and then what, when you um, do this telemetry work and you download their GPS collars, you get these cool little maps like this. And this is a very long running project and the goal is to try and find some sort of coexistence between the Maasai herdsmen and the wild dogs and cheetahs, which um, at times will take their goats. So of course it would be wrong of me not to show you some of the cute pictures of these critters that I got to work with, um, the cheetahs and wild dogs, of course. Um, around Impala, there's lots of other carnivores as well. Um, these are some of the common ones that you would see just around the base. Um, and of course, lots of other wildlife, just as you're commuting to and from your field site or into town, um, just kind of an animal lover's paradise. So you guys may be wondering, um, what's next for me? Um, that's still a good question. I'm sort of wondering myself. Um, there's a lot of options available to me with 
my degrees and my experience. Um, I've been thinking about perhaps going for a PhD or working in conservation with an NGO or even doing something like wildlife management in a national park. Um, so there's a few things that I hope that you guys can take away from this talk. Um, the first being that make sure you take advantage of all these research opportunities that the college provides for you. Um, they'll be really influential in if you decide to go to grad school or jobs that you may get. Um, and also, try and get summer internships if you can. It's tempting to relax during the summer or be a lifeguard or something like that, but if you have the opportunity, take these summer internships because they'll really help you um, in the future. Um, and also stay connected with these College of Idaho professors. They're amazing. They've helped me write count numerous letters of recommendation. They've counseled me on career choices, school choices, even just general life choices. So keep in touch with these guys. They're golden. Um, and as you have these jobs and internships, make sure you stay connected with the people that you work with because the world is small and you never know when these people will help you out or you'll come in contact with them later and they'll help you out. Um, and then keep your mind open to opportunities where you will least expect them. I ski bummed and drove shuttles thinking that was just a fun job, but it ended up getting me to Antarctica and eventually getting a really dream job in Antarctica in a lab. And if you guys don't know what you wanna do, that's fine. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do at your stage. Um, if you, there's 20 people in my grad school cohort, and if you ask them, I bet you 19 of them would tell you they still don't know what they want to do. So it's okay to be like that. Um, and I also, in my opinion, it's fine to take some time off to soul search, you know, hike the Pacific Crest Trail, do some traveling, um, do a job that you think would be fun. Um, I think those are all great things, and even if your parents are like, you need to be going straight into med school or whatever, um, it's okay to find out what it is that you're about and what you want. So, of course, a journey that covers this amount of time, there's a lot of people to thank, but I just want to extend a very special thanks to all the professors here and faculty that helped me on this journey. Um, so thank you guys, I really appreciate it. Um, and if you guys, any of you have questions, um, I think I may have a few minutes to talk, but feel free to approach me afterwards. Um, I'll be around this whole time, and I'm also very open to talking to you over email or a phone call or anything. My email address is tguy at ufl.edu. So thanks for having you guys. Thanks for having me. And any questions? No questions. Steve. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you get into a lot of these jobs, like science is maybe what your job entails, but a lot of it's communication with the public. Um, so public speaking, writing is a huge thing. Um, something that the college was strong at when I was here, and I'm sure it still is, is writing. Um, that's how you get grants and different things. Um, it also, just kind of having a big worldview. Um, for, especially when I was traveling, um, having all these different experiences in different classes, like I took Dr. Mon's London class um, and Garth's um, art history, like it really enriched, it enriched my traveling, having this kind of broader experience, but also just in your jobs themselves, um, having a background that's beyond science um, kind of puts you a step ahead because people like can respect your different opinions on things other than science. <laughs> Sarah. Yeah, 
Um, okay. Well, my favorite food of all the places I went to was in Thailand. Um, I love their food. But the most unique culture, I went to Papua New Guinea. Um, and I hiked up into some of the higher mountains where it's still a very traditional lifestyle where they, um, they don't wear clothes. Um, they have penis gourds, um, this kind of thing. And I was actually staying with a village and the guy came and warned me and said, you know, someone took someone's wife, there's going to be a war. So you might want to escape to higher ground. So I escaped to higher ground. Um, there were some spears thrown. Someone got a spear in the calf. Um, that's about all that happened. The guy got his wife back. Um, and everything was peachy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, con keeping connected with people is a big thing. Um, a lot of these opportunities came up because I, a former employer had said, hey, this other job's coming up. I liked how you worked. Um, do this. I spent a lot of time um, on internet searching for opportunities. Um, for biologists, there's this Texas A&M University website that has a lot of good opportunities. But it's really the connections and networking. Um, even the people at the College of Idaho, um, they're the ones that often told me about some of these jobs. Um, so I think the connections and the networking is probably the biggest way to keep those opportunities coming and succeeding when you do get the chance. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was wondering, all these opportunities, I'm sure they come with great sacrifice too. Can you talk a little bit about the sacrifices that you have to make? Yeah, um, I think the biggest sacrifice with a lot of these is that a lot of them are, are in remote areas, and I would miss like my family and friends. A lot of times you didn't have internet contact for a while, um, and also just sort of I would miss certain things of the American lifestyle, like. March Madness or the Super Bowl, you know, some of these, um, those are like sort of the main sacrifices that I had to deal with, which aren't that big in the long run. Any last questions? Thank you guys.